welcome, welcome to season two of Legends Corner, where only legends are allowed. I'm um, here today with a, a special <coughs> uh, somebody that I watched do it, uh, watch you know, growing his profession. Uh, my deputy athletic director, Coach Rich uh, Sylvester. I say it right. Did I say it right? It was close. It was okay. close. Say it again. That's, Correct. That's why it's it's Sylvester, but that's Sivosic. why everybody calls me Coach Z. And we all come with Coach Z. I, I've been on him since Coach Z since uh, my freshman year at A State, uh, 2015. And this guy literally has been a, a positive, positive light in my life. Uh, and he, he doesn't even know the half of it. So, I, Coach, I appreciate you for being here. Uh, appreciate you for. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Of course, of course. Um, like I said, this this sports podcast is dedicated to people that's interested in, in careers in athletics. So. Uh, just be asking you a couple questions about your your whole journey um, to the point where you are now. So, uh, Cozy, tell us where you're originally from. Uh, bring me back to your upbringing. So, I'm originally from Lorain, Ohio, okay. which uh, growing up is a small, or I shouldn't say small, it's a steel town outside of uh, Cleveland, right yeah. on Lake Erie. Um, you know, when I was growing up, um, you know, friends uh, of the family, my father's friends and uncles and cousins, they they all worked either in the steel mill or the Ford plant or the shipyards, um, you know, primarily uh, blue collar um, type town. And uh, my father was actually a high school track coach and a high school football coach. Okay. Um, more, he was a head, head track coach. Track was more his than, than, uh, than football. But, uh, so what happened is, you know, I grew up going to track meets and, and I can tell you this in Ohio track meets in, in March, there's some snow on the ground at times, there you go. Okay. <laughs> um, but, but I loved every minute of it. And, uh, you know, I saw the, the relationships that, that he built with his players and his runners and, and jumpers. Um, and I thought, wow, this would be a cool thing to do. Um, so I got the coaching bug um, early, probably sixth, seventh grade. Okay. Um, and uh, basketball ended up being my primary uh, love or primary sport. Um, but like a lot of kids growing up during that time, you, you just played whatever the season was. You played football, you played basketball, you played baseball, you ran track. And, you know, so from about the seventh grade on, I really wanted to be a coach. And then um, when I pretty much eighth grade, ninth grade, it was, it was all about basketball. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I was fortunate enough, my father um, went to uh, Miami of Ohio um, on a GI Bill. He was in World War II and then went there um, on the GI Bill and actually played football and ran track, played football for uh, Woody Hayes, the legendary okay. Ohio State coach. Gotcha. Um, and, and his teammates were uh, Eric Parsegian, who won a national championship as the head coach at Notre Dame, Bo Schimbeckler, who was, uh, won a national championship at, at Michigan, um, John Pont, who was the head coach at uh, Indiana and Northwestern. So uh, I actually got a chance to meet them growing up. And it was like, wow, you know, it's like these these guys were my idols. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so as I progressed along, I, I was a, a pretty good high school player. Okay. Not a, uh, you know, not a great player. Um, yeah, what but good enough to, to get us... Pardon me? What all sports did you play? You know, I played everything until my sophomore year in high school, and then I just concentrated on basketball. Um, you know, I joke about it. I played freshman football until my coach broke my nose, okay. which he didn't do intentionally. You know, it was one of those drills, and the face mask just went up my nose. And, you know, and at that point, I'm like, you know, I'm done with football. Um, little did I know that I'd break my nose a couple more times <laughs> playing basketball, catching an elbow. Uh, but 
you know, so I played for a, a guy in high school who is in the Ohio High School Hall of Fame, um, won about six or 700 games. And then when I went to college, it, it was a little bit different than maybe some players. Like you go to college and players uh, will, <coughs> excuse me, will want to know how many minutes are they going to play? Right. You know, am I going to start? Th those type of things. I asked my college coach one thing, and that was, can you get me a, a coaching job in college when I graduated? And he said, yes. So I believed him, went there. Um, Defiance College is where I went, which was a, a, a NEI school um, at the time. It was like a relative to a Division II school Okay. Um, now. Gotcha. And, you know, we had, we had some good teams, went to the national tournament. Um, I was not, you know, I was a much better player in my head uh, than the coach thought I was. Um, and I'll never forget. I mean, my senior year and he calls me in. I had worked all summer and, and thought I'd really improved my game and thought I was going to get a lot of minutes as a senior. And he called me in. And he says, uh, Rich, you have a choice. Um, you can either sit on the bench uh, in your uniform and not play much, or you can start your coaching career, sit on the bench in a coat and tie and, and, and start coaching. And like a lot of young guys at that time, uh, I thought I still could play. So I told them to shove it, um, <laughs> left, left his office. And uh, for the next two weeks, uh, I kind of drowned my sorrows in, uh, in a lot of beer. Okay. Um, <laughs> and my, my college roommate, who um, his name is Donnie Martindale, who's one of my roommates, he, um, he's now actually the defensive coordinator for the uh, New York Giants. Um, he, he said to me, he says, Rich, he says, he says, what are you doing? He says, he's giving you a chance to coach. He says, you're not going to play professionally. And, you know, all we've ever heard from you for the last three years is, oh, I'm going to be a college coach and I'm going to do go. this and I'm going <laughs> to do that coaching wise. Right. So just go back and apologize to the guy. So I, w I went back to uh, Coach Hohenberger's office. Marv Hohenberger was the coach's name. My tail tucked between my legs and uh, apologized. He accepted the apology, never said another word. I coached was an assistant for the varsity and coached the JV team at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the year, he, he got me a graduate assistant position at Bowling Green State University, um, where I ended up getting my master's degree in coaching for a year and really got my coaching start at Bowling Green. Um, and, you know, I, I owe it to Coach Owenberger for, <laughs> for helping me get the graduate assistant job and then just kind of moved from there. Um, you know, I, I took a job <clears throat> at the time. What guys would do is you would work as a player. You would work a lot of summer basketball camps. Okay. So I basically went around the country and worked 10 weeks of, of summer camp um, as my, as you know, my summer vacation, so to speak. And it ranged from, you know, Syracuse university to university of Connecticut to Notre Dame, to Purdue, um, Mason Dixon camp, which was held at Mount St. Mary's um, in Maryland, okay. um, Jack Kern camp in New York City. So I, I really got a wide exposure for a, a kid from, you know, Steel Mill Town in Ohio to kind of be traveling around the country in the summer. It really exposed me to a lot of things and it exposed me to a lot of people. Um, and ironically or I shouldn't say ironically but networking wise um you know my first coaching job was in North Carolina at a school called Barton College um back then it was called Atlantic Christian College it was an NAI school worked there for a year um and then got got my start in division one at Loyola College in Baltimore mm -hmm. uh, was an assistant there for Mark Amatucci for three years and then got my big break and um, got the job at St. Francis College in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And I want to talk more about that. So at St. Francis College, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you became the youngest Divi NCAA Division I uh, coach at 27. Uh, take us back. What was the mindset at a, at a young 27 <laughs> first head coach job 
youngest head coach job at, at the time. Well, you know, it's funny. Before you get too excited about it, nobody wanted the job. Okay. They hadn't had a winning season. In, <laughs> they hadn't had a winning season in two decades. Um, but I was too young, too dumb, too naive. I thought, right. you know, <laughs> I, can, so right on I it. can change everything, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, I'll never forget. I mean, my, my first game, uh, we're, we're getting ready to play, and <clears throat> we're playing Winthrop University. And, uh, and they're playing the national anthem. And, you know, just kind of rocking back and forth. And the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. I'm so excited. You know, this is going to be the first of many wins, right? Mm -hmm. And I look down, and my best player, Darwin Purdy, has the, the worst look on, on his <laughs> face. And I'm like, oh, my God. This what are we going to do? This is, you know, if my best player is not ready to go. We're in trouble. Right. So the song ends, uh, you know, the anthem ends. I walked down and put my arm around Darwin. I said, Darwin, I said, what's wrong? He says, coach, he says, you know, every time they play this song, we play bad afterwards. Mm. And I looked at him and I'm thinking, oh, man, they, you know, they play yeah, the national true. anthem before every game. We're in right. <laughs> So it actually, it was the last time we played the national anthem at St. Francis. We played God Bless America for the next three years. Darwin Purdy ended up having a, a great career he ended up the all-time leading scorer at the school and uh, i learned my first coaching lesson oh wow you know, it's all about the players and and making the players feel confident but you know i, I remember winning that first game and, and thinking oh man this is unbelievable he says you know this is you know move over you know mike Krzyzewski, move over right. bob knight <laughs> john wooden I, I, I'm, I'm gonna win a thousand you know i'm gonna win 800 <laughs> games you know and uh and then we ended up losing in my next game by one point. So I, my undefeated string uh, ended quickly. But, um, you know, it was an experience in, in New York. Um, you know, for somebody who had never lived in, in Brooklyn or in New York mm -hmm. City, my first year, <clears throat> first part of the first year, I, I lived in Long Island. So I would take the, the subway to the Long Island Railroad. And, right. Uh, I'll never forget after that, after the first game, we went out, my staff and I, which really the staff consisted of one other guy. Um, and we went out and celebrated the win while well, I'm coming home. And we, this, this is a true story, by the way. So I'm taking, I take the subway to the Long Island Railroad. And then on the Long Island Railroad, you have to, to transfer um, in Jamaica, Queens. And so I'm, I'm on the platform waiting for the, the next train to come. Mm -hmm. And I see a guy with a St. Francis College jacket on. And I'm like, oh, this is unbelievable. Like, right. St. Francis College is very, very small. It was a commuter Ooh. school. And I'm thinking, I, this is like an omen. You know, we got right. a, a fan, you know, wearing right. jackets. I, I kind of rushed over to him and I, I tapped him on the shoulder and I was like, oh, man. Can you believe it? We won tonight. <laughs> I'm all excited. And the guy turns around and I kid you not, he looks at me and he's got one eye. And like, usually when somebody has one eye, they have a patch over Correct. the other eye. Right. He did. He didn't like, I could see into his brain and oh, I'm God. thinking, Ooh, I need to get away <laughs> from this guy really quick. Um, but you know, that, that's the, the uniqueness of, of New York <laughs> City. But, um, you know, it was it, it, the mindset really, you asked earlier, <clears throat> you know, it was really, I was so close to the, the player's age. Um, you know, I had some guys that were 22, 23 years old. I'm only three or four years older than them. Right. So, right. I mean, to some some degree, I, I think I related better because of it, um, you know, and, you, and so it was just kind of here's step by step. Let's try and build this program and, and create something special. <coughs> Excuse me. And three years later, um, we had their first winning season in, in a couple of decades, um, won a conference tournament um, game, which they had never done. Um, you know, was named coach of the year. And now it was, you know, um, do I come back for another year or do I look for, for greener pastures? I, I had 
when I went to New York City, it was just my wife and I. Right. Um, by the end of that third year, we had one son and one on the way. Okay. So um, the one thing about Catholic schools that you learn very quickly that the the priest takes the vow of poverty and they make you live it. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't making a whole lot of money. So uh, I'll never forget. I interviewed for three jobs. I interviewed um, at Iona College. Um, which is where Jim Valvano um, of North Carolina State fame, where he got his start. Um, University of Alaska Anchorage okay. and uh, the University of North Florida. North Florida was starting a program and, and Anchorage was way too cold. I don't care that the guy, the, the AD was like, well, you know, you have the Japanese winds and they keep it yeah. cool. I said, listen, <laughs> How, how many days a year does it stay 32 degrees or lower? Because I'm, I'm not a genius, but I know everything freezes at 32. It does. So, and, and when he says, ah, you know, about nine or 10 months, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. a little too cold. <laughs> right. Um, so the job I really wanted was Iona, but I didn't get it. And, uh, but I was offered the University of North Florida job and I, I decided to accept that. And that was my second stop on the journey. And being in North Florida, <coughs> uh, building that program from, from, from scratch, what goals did you have in mind at that time? And uh, what kind of helped you achieve those goals? You know, it, it's funny. Um, University of North Florida had, had very high academic standards. Um, like all schools in the state of Florida, they had what, what they called the border region standards. But like if you're at Florida or Florida State, 10% of your student body can be exceptions to those standards, mm -hmm. which is how kind of those athletic departments survive to some degree. Right. But at the University of North Florida, I had a, a president who said, we're not going to make any exceptions. Um, so it was a little bit more of a challenge, but, you know, we thought we could be more like the, at the time, North Florida was division two. So we thought we could be like the, the Duke of division two, mm -hmm. but it was a tough challenge. Um, you know, the first, first guy I signed, Chris Sneed, um, who actually I talked to last week, just a, a terrific young man, um, 1400, 1450 on the SATs. Um, okay. You know, just terrific kid, you know, wasn't a great player, couldn't right. make a layup at the time we recruited him, but he could rebound. Right. You know, by the time he graduated, he was, you know, was a pretty good offensive player and actually went on to play professionally for about 13 years overseas. So, you know, we just had a good group of kids, um, you know, and then I was there for a total of six years, five seasons. And, and then I just realized that, you know, they weren't going to go division one. I, I had to get back. I wanted to get back up north in a division one setting. Um, so I ended up taking a job at Millersville in Pennsylvania as a head coach, which is another division two school. And then kind of worked my way back up at, at St. Peter's College uh, in uh, New Jersey, American University in Washington, D.C. So uh, before I finished up at uh, the University of Missouri, Kansas City, which was my last coaching stop. Yep. And, and there at the University of Missouri at Kansas City, um, talk about the accolades there. Uh, talk about that time there at Kansas City as well. You know, we, we, had a, we had a pretty good run. I was there a total of seven years, um, six as the head coach. Okay. Um, to kind of put it in perspective, I left as the all-time winningest coach. Um, but, you know, we switched athletic directors and he wanted his own guy. Uh, which is okay. I mean, that happens in every, uh, you know, it, to some degree I've learned in every line of work, right. especially in college athletics. Um, but, you know, we, to kind of put it in perspective, uh, our success, <clears throat> the eight years prior to, to our arrival, um, they had had only one winning season. Um, since then, and I've been out of coaching now, this will be my 16th year. And in the 16 years since then, they've had two winning seasons. Um, in my six years as the head coach, we had four. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we had a, a pretty good run by, by UMKC standards. But, 
you know, I learned a lot in, in all of those coaching positions that really prepared me for the future. Um, you know, at North Florida, because it was a new program, you know, we started our own booster club and, we, you know, created a marketing plan. And, you know, so I had an opportunity to do a lot of different things besides just coach, um, you know, and at UMKC, it was more, you know, Kansas City is a town that's, you know, owned by the University of Kansas and the University of Missouri. So, you know, we were trying to carve out a niche there um, in, in a downtown arena and, you know, feel pretty good about it. We, you know, we averaged, you know, about six, 7,000 fans. Okay. Um, during, during the run. So, which is, which is good. You know, the arena's, the arena sat about 8,000. Okay. Um, so it was, it was a pretty, pretty solid, uh, pretty solid deal. And you mentioned this was your last uh, coaching gig. Uh, what was the transition to administration? Uh, what, what was the thought there? <laughs> well, there was really no thought. Okay. Um, when I got into coach, when I got into coaching, and I, and I remember my uh, my mother in law asking me, uh, you know, you know, I'm marrying her daughter, and and she says, well, what are you going to do after uh, you finish coaching? And I told her, I said, well, I, I hope I'm retired and, and living on the beach somewhere mm -hmm. um, with grandkids. And so I, I really didn't think much past coaching okay. um, early in my early in my career. And, and even, you know, when it happened at UMKC, I, I was a little bit caught off guard, um, actually, to the point that I got fired I, actually on my birthday, okay. um, which which gives me a great story. Right. Uh, not a lot of not a lot of people get fired on their birthday. <laughs> um, but I, I had a year on my contract left. And so it gave me an opportunity to kind of, you know, stop and smell the roses and see what else was out there. Um, you know, and probably is the reason why, you know, I, I didn't stay in coaching um, <clears throat> because. I, my oldest was going to be a senior in high school. My my younger son was going to be a sophomore. And then my daughter was in junior high. So okay. I didn't really want to move them again. Right. Um, my oldest actually went to seven different schools in 12 years. Um, so, you know, I, I, I figured, all right, what else can I do? Um, so like a lot of coaches, I, I went into TV. Um, and was fortunate enough the first year I worked for the Big Ten Network um, and did some public speaking, motivational speaking, and um, got the acting bug, did a little acting. Okay. Um, you know, we, we had, uh, had had a, a situation where when I was at American University, I answered a, a casting call um, for Along Came a Spider, a movie and got cast as an FBI agent in the movie. Okay. And had had gotten an opportunity to be on set for a couple of days um, with Morgan Freeman was the star of the, the movie, him and uh, Monica Potter. Oh, wow. who, by the way, Morgan Freeman is really a very nice man. Oh, wow. Um, you know, I'm sitting there as, you know, one of the nobodies, you know, uh, on set and, you know, he talks to you like, uh, like, like yeah, you're yeah I mean, just made you feel good, you know, right. like a right. regular guy. Um, and then when I got to UMKC, we, we did a bunch of season ticket commercials just with me and, and the kangaroo, which was our mascot. So when I left coaching, I had enough of a, a demo reel or a background to get an agent in Kansas city and, and start to do some commercial work and continue to do some film and, and TV. So, you know, I've been fortunate enough to, to still do those two things for mm -hmm. the last 16 years, still broadcasting, still doing some, <coughs> still doing some uh, commercials and, and film and TV and that. Um, but I really kind of caught, caught the break um, to get into administration um, when a former uh, colleague of mine, uh, Terry Mahajer, who was actually um, the associate athletic director when I was at UMKC, 
he he was the guy who actually sold my radio show man i'm glad i gave him a big cut because <laughs> he is he's he's paid uh, it's paid back in dividends so he gets the job as the athletic director at arkansas state where he had played football and he called me out of the blue and said hey i want to start a jobs program um you know kind of different i mean when he graduated from college you know, basically the coach patted him on the back and said, hey, go get him. Mm -hmm. And that was it. That was the only support you got. So right. when he called me, he says, hey, you know, this is what I want, want to start. Are you interested? Um, you know, at that point in time, I had never been to Jonesboro, Arkansas. Um, so I drove up and for a football game. Actually, Gus Malzahn was, ironically, was the head football coach that year. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I drove up to the, to the football game and there, I mean, well, you went to school there, so, you know, I mean, yes. the tailgating and the right. football was a big deal. It was. I had no idea. And so I was like, you know, if, if all I got to do is try and help kids get jobs and connect them, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's kind of what I, I've been doing on the administrative side as a primary, um, you know, uh, the the jobs program is something that you know is near and dear to my heart um you know it's it, it goes back to you know why did you, you when you ask the question why did you get into coaching you know it's those relationships it's you know to watch um young people like yourselves you know just go on and be successful Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, you know, that's, that's how I get my win, wins these days. Um, yeah. so I, I, I did it for eight years there at Arkansas state. And then, um, the last two years, I guess we're in our third graduating class now at, at UCF. And <laughs> story, just a quick story time. I, I always looked up to coach Z man. Uh, like I say, me being a student athlete at Arkansas state, uh, me and money, we laugh about it often because I still remember those days where after certain seminars or maybe just athletic events, or you maybe just walking around, you'll see a kid and you ask them, why haven't you been to my office yet? Uh, you know, you help so <laughs> many, <laughs> you have so many of us. And I've uh, honestly been on that other side. You looked at me a couple of times. So why haven't you been to my office? And I'm so glad that I, I went to your office. You might not even remember, but uh, I went and I was interested in sports administration. Uh, didn't know anything about different departments and, and different uh, areas in sports administration. But you, you know, gave me some advice, told me to do my research and, you know, come back with to you if you had any questions or, or you know, concerns about anything. And that was the day that I, I made the decision to uh, – you know, kind of go on my journey that I am today. So I, I appreciate you. I know a lot of guys um, and a lot of, of ladies that I went to school with Arkansas so State appreciate you as well. You know, and it, and it's funny. And I, I tell this, I, I told this to all the kids at Arkansas State, all the athletes, and, and I tell the same thing to, to the guys and, and girls at, at UCF. You know, if, if you ever need help, you just call me. Yeah, I don't care if it's your first first job or you're looking for your next job or or whatever. And, and I, I'll give you I'll give you two quick stories. So about a year ago now, I get a call from Skyler Culver. I okay. don't know if he was there at the same time as you. He was a baseball player. He was, he was there a little bit before, before me, but I definitely remember the name. <laughs> and he got drafted, played in the minors for about five or six years. And he calls me like a year ago, April. And he says, coach, I'm done with baseball. I'm looking for a job in Memphis. Can you help me out? Mm -hmm. And I told him, and I told him, I said, listen, I don't work at UC. I don't work at Arkansas state anymore. I work at UCF. And he's like, right. Oh no, no, don't, you know, don't, don't worry about it. You know? And I said, no, no, no. I told you I would help you when you were done with baseball. Right. I'll, I'll help you. So, as fate would have it, um, a contact of mine uh, with Hershey's, uh, Brian D'Ambrosio, okay, um, who had actually hired a former baseball player a couple of years prior. And so I called him up and like I said, as fate would have it, he had an opening in the Memphis area for mm -hmm. a sales rep. 
and I connected him and Skyler and, and Skyler ended up taking the job um, with Hershey's. Um, and, and he did one thing that, uh, that I, I laugh about all the time. Cause I, I tell, and I know I've told you the same thing of course. when you get a job, how about, how about telling me, Yeah. You know, how about letting me know where <laughs> you're at, you know? So about, I don't know, maybe three or four weeks later, <laughs> after I had talked to, to Brian and, and Skyler, uh, something came across my desk about a job opening in Memphis. And I thought, Hey, you know, maybe this would be a good fit for Skyler. Right. So I called Skyler. I say, I said, Skyler, I said, I got this other opportunity. He says, Oh, I started working for Hershey's two weeks ago. I'm like, Thank you know, you, you could have, yeah. right. You know, um, but I mean, that, that's, that's how, how you get your wins, you know? And, um, I, I'm trying to think, was was Henry Ophaya, was yes. he there when you were there? Yes, Henry Ophaya was you know. there. And he's probably going to listen to this podcast, Henry. So you got your little 15 seconds. So, so I, I, I got to tell you, um, and I and I shouldn't, shouldn't say it's just track guys because it's across all sports, but it <laughs> the number of track guys, it's kind of funny. Right. So I, I'll never f- forget the first time I meet Henry. He comes in my office and he says, hey, he says, can you help me with Coach Patchell and scholarship money? And I'm like, right. I, I <laughs> don't know that I can really help you with anything. Correct. You know, <laughs> you got to go. You got to go talk to Coach Patchell. And and he says, oh, OK. And um, I don't know, maybe a week or two later. I see Henry. I say, "Hey, Henry, I, ne- I never heard from you again." And he says, "No, nah, I, I talked to Richie Chavez, uh, who was, you know, the the shot putter, all American right. shot putter yep. at Arkansas State." Yep. And Richie kind of set Henry straight. He said, "Hey, Henry, if you want more scholarship money, you got to score points <laughs> in the conference meet." And I that's thought, the only oh, way you'll get points. You got to be productive. That's the only way. That's and, the only and, way. And, and, and Henry understood it. And he got a little better. Um, so fast forward, um, Henry has just kind of turned down a lot of jobs that I've been involved with, with <laughs> either directly or indirectly. Right? Right. Um, he's offered a job at Auburn um, as a grad assistant position in marketing and turns it down. Um, he... I mean, I'm trying to think. He was at Tulane. He was at, yep. Am I right on that? Correct. Correct. He was at Tulane, <clears throat> ironically, working for a girl, Jana Woodson, uh, who was formerly Jana Ross, who who was the marketing person when I was the head basketball coach at UMKC. Okay. Um, so a little small world stuff. Well, we have an opening at UCF. We think he's going to take it, and he turns down another job. So, I, if, Henry, if you're listening, I'm never getting going to offer you another job. <laughs> you know, I'm telling you, but hey. he, he's another guy. He's doing so well. Hey, Henry's great. It's funny because I look at Henry like a, a big brother, and he always like you know mentoring me, whether that's been good or bad. But when he told me that he turned down, oh, out it's a good. Job, it's good. I told him, I said, man, they'll never offer you a job again. So it's funny that I said the same thing, but we love Henry, man. Love Henry. You gotta love him. Oh, he's, I mean, and, and he's a terrific kid, obviously, or, or he wouldn't definitely. be offered so many jobs. Definitely. Definitely. Oh, and man. coach, let's let's kind of just dive into uh your position, uh senior deputy athletic director of internal operations at UCL. <laughs> uh just give us a little light about what you do and why you why you love what you do there at UCF. So it's, you know, still primarily um, I run the jobs program. They have a little bit uh, more resources, more people helping with that. Um, and then I, I'm the supervisor um, or, or sports administrator for football, uh, men's basketball and women's track. Um, I'm pleased to say football has been good. Um, Mm -hmm. basketball is having a, basketball is having a very good year right now. Um, I've been fortunate enough, uh, to work with three terrific coaches, coach Malzahn, who was at Arkansas state really prior to me. So before I took the job, he left to go back to Auburn, but, 
Um, Johnny Dawkins, um, yep. the former Duke All-American, uh, former head coach at Stanford, just a, a, a terrific coach, just an unbelievable coach and, and just a, one of the best human beings you'll ever meet. Um, and then Dana Boone is our, our women's track coach. Mm -hmm. Um, and she, another one who is, you know, just flat out terrific. And we joke about it because she was the head track coach at Texas state. Okay. Um, when, when I was at Arkansas state, Correct. And, Correct. uh, you know, so I, I river, I, I, on your behalf, I river about, uh, you know, Arkansas state dominated the Sun Belt track. I don't there know what happened go. to Texas. State. <laughs> I don't know. You know? <laughs> um, I don't know. But she, she's actually. She's done very well here. She she won the indoor uh, and the outdoor last year in the American, um, and has a has a good team coming back, led by a, a young lady, Renaya Jones, who's um, I think finished third in the hurdles okay. um, a year ago in the nationals. Um, you know, and and again, I I had to rub it in. I said, you know. I mean, Renaya is good. She finished third, but you know, I was at Arkansas State when Sharika Nelvis won the national there championship. You go. So, there you go. <laughs> you know, so she got uh, a lot to work to do. But she, I tell you, but she, they're terrific, and they and they're a great group of kids. Um, and then <clears throat> I, I'm the supervisor for um, our nutrition area and our strength and conditioning, in uh, in TV and video. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been a big push um, with pretty much every Division One school now with ESPN and running your own broadcasts and correct. Um, so that's that's a huge, huge undertaking uh, for us, especially now. Uh, you know, we go into the Big Twelve Conference next year. So, um, congrats on you that. Know, so those are kind yeah. of the areas. Thank you, thank you. It's you know, those are kind of the areas that I touch directly and then you know kind of touch just about everything else indirectly because you know through the jobs program it's you know like you said Callum uh, I'm I'm going to every player I see hey I haven't seen you in my office no, definitely. yet you know, <laughs> you know hey. I, yeah, as you as you know I'll embarrass you, if you no definitely you. definitely <laughs> and that's why I said you you got to keep doing it got to keep the tradition going because I, I tell you money this all the time. That what made me uh, put a little pep in my step and I got to go visit Coach D in his office because he cares. Um, and, and that's really all that matters. That's all it boils yeah. down to is you care about the young women and the young young men in the, in the program. And once you get somebody to care about you and give you a chance and a shot, man, the sky's the limit, definitely. So, and with all your success and all the people that you've touched, uh, through athletics, through sports. You're also an author, which is a great thing, big thing for yeah. me. Uh, I aspire to write my write a book uh, in the future. What is the process of sharing your journey um, with others through these books? You know, it's funny. Um, I guess I've written three, although one was kind of a compilation of stories. So I only had a story in it. But, um, it and, it's, and it's kind of weird how things have, have or got started with that when I finished coaching and I, I wanted to go out and do some motivational speaking the speakers bureau uh, mm -hmm. or the guy Steve Gardner who ran it you know his first question to me was well are you published and I said no he says well you need to write a book like okay that's an easy thing to right. do right uh, okay Great. so I thought I you know I thought hey that'll be easy I said you know I, I've I worked as a, a <coughs> excuse me, as a sports reporter, um, you know, right out of college for a newspaper. So I can write a little bit. And so I thought, all right, I'm going to write this book basically on my journey coaching and mm -hmm. <coughs> give people a different perspective than, you know, somebody who's at the, the Blue Bloods, the North Carolinas, the Kansas, right. the you know, here's, here's somebody who's taken a different path. And so I went about six weeks and just trying to write this. And I think I had about three pages written. And I finally realized, you know what? It's like anything else in life. You got to have a plan and you got to work the plan. 
Definitely. And so I, I decided, all right, this is how we're going to do it. Every morning, I, I'm going to go run, kind of formulate my, my thoughts, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to write for an hour. Whether or not I want to write or not, I'm going to sit there in front of the, the computer and I'm going to write for an hour. <clears throat> Some days, it, man, it was a struggle to get to an hour. Other days, you know, it was flowing and, and uh, you know, you go for two or three. But right. about six about six weeks later, um, uh, I had the first draft done. And uh, I had a friend of mine who uh, is a columnist, Kansas City Star, who edited it for me. Um, and I'll never forget, I, I was sitting on vacation on the beach in, in uh, Ocean City, Maryland. And I had the first draft of birds, dogs, and kangaroos. Yep. And it was, it, it, it was, you know, my guy, Greg had edited and I had never seen so much red ink, uh, on a, on a report in my life. Not since I was probably in 10th grade in high school. Right. And <laughs> I mean, but he was, he was fantastic to the point where he checked everything. And, you know, there were things that we argued about my memory wasn't as good as when he actually went back to the box scores Correct. <laughs> and, uh, and corrected me because he wanted everything right. So, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to land a publisher, <coughs> Ascend Media, which was based out of Kansas City. Okay. And about three or four months later after that um, was published and out in the bookstores, um, we actually had a great run. I mean, we sold 10,000 copies, yeah, which wow. um, to kind of put that in perspective, it puts, uh, it puts a book in the top 5% of books sold that year, mm -hmm. which, you know, you think about all the hundreds of thousands of books that are published every year. So, um, you know, we did, a, uh, we had a good, good ride with that. So. I'm still on sale now. I still have some. In no, print. definitely. I was I was <laughs> anybody, getting to that for sure. Ever, we will drop. Anybody the link. wants to reach out? Definitely, yeah. we'll drop the link uh, below to purchase uh, uh, birds, dogs, and kangaroos. Just, the the life just, of the uh, use my in college e basketball, right? Just exactly. Just use my email address. Shoot me an email, and I'll send you an autographed copy. There you go. For ten dollars. <laughs> I got you. I got you. I, I'm I'm gonna get two copies. So I'll be I'll be definitely reaching out to you for one because I, I need it. Uh just always add the book to, to the collection. Um and final, final question. I appreciate your time so much here on the Legends Corner. Uh we dedicate this podcast to kind of just showcase uh the different roles you can take in athletics, right? As someone who seems to have done it all. Uh, what is your personal advice for those searching for the right career in, in sports? You know, I mean, as I, as I started out, you know, just thinking I was just going to coach. The, the one thing that, uh, you know, my father taught me, and I can still hear his, his words in my head today, you know, um, if you're going to burn, if you're going to burn your bridges, you better be a damn good swimmer. Mm. And I, I don't know how to swim very okay. well. I, I, <laughs> right. I'm okay. I'm okay if I can get to the side of a pool, but if I'm in, <laughs> in a lake or an ocean, bury me. Yeah, forget sea. about it. Right. Um, but I, so I, I, I took that lesson to heart. And I, and I think the most important thing is, you know, a make as many friends as you can along the way um you know <clears throat> just the people that you meet uh, on the way up you know treat them nice you know because you never know when you're going to be on your way down and you you really never know um you know what that person could mean to you in the future mm -hmm. now that being said um you know the second piece of advice is you know if you're going to have your hand out, you better have something in your hand to give. Um, you know, and if you go into every relationship with what's in it for me, you're going to be a lonely person. Gotcha. Um, it's really about what, what can I give to somebody else? Um, and if you, as, 
I think it was Zig Ziglar who said, if you can help enough people get what they want, you'll get what you want. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, you know, those are, those are some of the things that, that you find. And, you know, I, I quote, I quote from the movie, Jerry Maguire all the time. And, you know, probably I'm starting to date myself <laughs> on that, but, there is a, a scene in, in Jerry Maguire. They have an old time agent that they would flash on. He would okay. say, you know, if you, if you don't have it, if you don't have it here and he would tap his heart, if you don't have it here. then what's up here doesn't matter. And it's so true. If you don't have the passion for something, then you can be the smartest person in the world. It's not going to work out. Right. But, you know, <laughs> which goes to, you know, don't be afraid to, to try just about anything because you never know when you're going to find your passion Definitely. or where that passion is going to be. Um, I'll use my oldest son as, as a perfect example. He, he didn't want to get in coaching, but he wanted to do something in athletics. So he started out as a graduate assistant at Kansas in their fundraising area. He did it for about six months and he told me, he says, listen, he says, there is no way I can do fundraising <laughs> for the rest of my life. He wasn't the type of guy that, could ask people for money right so he changed gears <clears throat> he went into athletic marketing and ended up doing that at sam houston state and then creighton okay um, and then got and then and, and liked it wasn't thrilled with all the extra time he got married had a had a daughter um and moved to northern illinois and then louisiana where he's now okay and he took a job running running the call center at lsu in their foundation did it you know until COVID hit and then <clears throat> a bunch of people got laid off and he's now the director of uh memberships for the louisiana dental association okay and he absolutely loves his job and you know i don't think i could be wrong but i don't think anybody grows up saying you know golly i want to be the membership guy for the dental association Correct. in Louisiana. I Correct. mean, it, it doesn't happen. Right. But the one thing that, that the thread that ties it all together is he's a people person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that's the one thing that you've got to find out about yourself. If you're that type of person, you can be successful doing just about anything in, in sports, especially, um, you know, you, whether it's athletic marketing, whether it's, fundraising, compliance, academics, it all comes back to one thing. It comes back to, to uh, the person, it comes back to the student athlete and how do you service them? How do you help them? Um, because that's, I mean, that's really what it's all about. Uh, definitely, Coach. Coach, I appreciate you. This, Coach Z, uh, the friend, the father, the mentor, the college <laughs> coach, the, the basketball analyst, the actor, the author, Senior Deputy Athletic Director, we, we thank you. We thank you so much, Coach Z. Appreciate you. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate you. Of course, of course. Until next time, appreciate y'all for tuning in for another episode uh, this season, man. We, we're going hard and we're getting some, some great people on. So until next time.